Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Anna Devere Smith and thank you so much for joining us for today's SIG Space Summit. This is the second in a special series of three talks that I'm doing this fall. No, I'm not really talking, I'm asking questions, called Twilight 2020. For each of them, I'm inviting people with connections to my play, Twilight, Los Angeles, 1992, to talk about how the current unrest and protests around the killings of George Floyd and others echo the events around the beating of Rodney King that are the subject of that play. I'm thrilled to be talking to today's guest, Hector Tobar. Hector is a Los Angeles born author and journalist who was a dramaturg on the original production of Twilight. He was at the Los Angeles Times for over two decades where he was part of the reporting team that won uh, a Pulitzer Prize for the coverage of the 1992 LA riots. He is also the author of six novels and uh, a nonfiction account Deep Down Dark, The Untold Stories of 33 Men Buried in a Chilean Mine and the Miracle That Set Them Free, which was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, he's currently a fellow at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute, The Gift of Time is what that is. Hello, Hector. Hello, Anna. It's so wonderful to, to see you again. I think of you as a cousin in the way, you know, that the kids go, hey, cuz, you know, cuz. Um, uh, it was uh, so amazing to come close to you um, in the time that I was writing Twilight Los Angeles. Um, you were a gift and I just Thank always you. was so grateful for you, you know, because we called you a dramaturg, but the dramaturgs are very different <clears throat> in, in that play than, than traditional. I think there were five. Um, mm -hmm. Among them, you, Doreen Kondo, Elizabeth Alexander, who's now president of Mellon Foundation, and um, you know it was it was powerful time together. I wonder if you remember the second verdict. Um, you know, uh, there were two mm -hmm. verdicts. People forget there were right, two right. verdicts. And I a uh, civil before, case. Right. Before you were telling one of our actresses, Tiffany Rochelle Stewart, that it was well, it was a year away, and we kind of put it behind us. But I recall within. Mm -hmm less than a month of my first preview was what was called the second verdict that George Bush had ordered a second trial. And the cops went back on trial again, federal trial. And I went to that trial, I visited that trial. And wow. the, 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 the city was on pins and needles. Absolutely, what I remember. absolutely. And the day, I don't know if you remember this, on the day that the verdict was gonna come down because everybody thought it was gonna be another riot if right. that verdict didn't come think, back, yeah. quote unquote, right. You called me at my hotel or wherever I was living. And you said, I'm down here at the courthouse. I have a gas mask for you if you want to join me. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes, because the Los Angeles Times, uh, <laughs> having been absolutely underprepared and, and unaware of that, that the city was about to explode when the first uh, you know, verdict came in, had it completely overprepared us the second time around. And so I had this full outfit. I had um, you know, body armor. And I had a gas mask. Yes, I remember that really vividly. And I, I sort of sensed that it was overkill. I thought, I really thought this, that I, I didn't anticipate it was going to be that terrible. And, you know, it, it turned out not to be, thank God. Well, I went down there and I was in the room. I don't even know how in the world I got in the room for that verdict, but I was there. And I don't know why I didn't accept your gas mask. I, I remember thinking maybe I should and being really scared and all of that stuff. Well, when you, but what's the difference, Hector? It's so great to be talking to you as both a journalist and a particular humanist uh, in that way that you write fiction and nonfiction <clears throat> and understand human beings from those kinds of ways, those points, that, that from those frames. What's different now at post of the murder of George Floyd and those days uh, in Los Angeles that did resonate worldwide? Well, you know, uh, I hate to be too optimistic, but, um, you know, the city really, many of the city institutions have integrated themselves uh, in the in the generation that's passed. You know, and in that time we had very, we had like one or two member, Latino members of the city council. Now there's almost a majority of Latino members in the city council, the LAPD. The LAPD is one of the few institutions uh, in California that has a demographic, uh, you know, uh, portrait that actually matches the city that it covers. You know, there's almost a plurality of Latino officers on the LAPD. So, um, so there's been that, those changes. 
um, there has been uh, an integration, I think, of the of the middle class and the intelligentsia in the city. My kids went to really nice uh, private schools with, uh, you know, <laughs> with a selected diversity of, uh, of students. On the other hand, uh, what's happened is that we've had this incredible growth uh, in the disparities of wealth and poverty. You know, the middle class was a much more robust middle class uh, in, in the 1990s than it is today. You know, I driving around the city this morning, I passed a half dozen homeless camps, you know, and, and that homelessness existed when we were supposedly in the middle of this boom, you know, the, the boom of the, the, of the Obama years and the first uh, of the current president, um, that economic boom, there were still, you know, just there still have been you know, hundreds of thousands of homeless people in California and tens of thousands here in Los Angeles. That is extremely troubling, you know, to see Los Angeles um, become a harsher city, you know? I mean, I think of LA in the 1990s, and this comes across in your play. There's still, you know, the hint of sort of like, you know, hey, you know, we are, this is a California, we're all supposed to get along, which was what the shock of, of Rodney King and then uh, of the riots was, was that we don't really get along. But still, you know, California was this sort of friendlier place and now it's a, it's a more crowded and harsher place. Lo Los Angeles feels a lot more like New York to me every day. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, I lived in Venice uh, for a couple of years and that, you know, the homeless, it's like a, a special homeless city almost yes. around Gold's Gym and all of that. Well, um, well, well you know, right now, um, people after the murder of George Floyd and, and now people say this is an unprecedented moment. Mm. Um, to, to, to what extent is that true, not true, and specifically in relationship to the Los Angeles uprising? Well, you know what, when, when, when 1992, ha when 1991 happened, when we saw that infamous video of Rodney King, and think about it, think of the history of, the, of, of these videos. Uh, the Rodney King video was one of the first Right, because uh, video cameras, portable video cameras, were brand new. You know, the guy who was trying out his first video camera, George and now Holliday. we have, the, yeah, the George, George, yeah, George Holiday, an Argentine guy, and now we have in the George Floyd era, everybody's carrying a, a, a camera with them. You know, um, and so, but, but, you know, what this, but police brutality was an element of Los Angeles life going back. And now that, I, now that I've studied more Los Angeles history, it's going back to the 19th century, <laughs> to the 18th century. You have this incredible long thread, right, of, of violence by people, uh, you know, serving in positions of authority. And in the months before Rodney King, we were hearing all of these stories of police abuse. You had, uh, you know, relatively sedate institutions like the NAACP uh, having workshops on police brutality caused by the war on drugs, you know? And so that story has been a continual story uh, in Los Angeles history, in, Cal in United States history. And now to sort of finally see it enter people's living rooms in a way in which they can finally not deny it. And I think there, you know, I think there was a, a confluence of, uh, uh, of events, you know, perhaps if George Floyd doesn't happen during the pandemic, when we're all at home in this, you know, forced state of reflection, right? George Floyd hits us when we're all locked at home looking at videos, right? Perhaps that's the secret, the, the magic part of the, the magic part of this ingredient, right? That causes us to finally look at this, see this reality, which of course has been part of American reality, um, you know, since, you know, for, for so long. Well, you know, what I hear you saying too, is that they're suggesting maybe I'm gathering it's not that the events are unprecedented, but the level of awareness is unprecedented. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, absolutely. I think too, you know, I, I remember seeing those first protests in Minneapolis, you know, the day after that, you know, in the 48 hours after George Floyd um, was killed. And I was really struck by how racially integrated that neighborhood was, you know, and that's like a lot of neighborhoods in the United States now, you know, maybe caused by gentrification or people resisting gentrification, you have these neighborhoods where hip white people live next to people of color, <laughs> right? And so you have this level, uh, it's not just that, I mean, there's this level of comfort. I mean, I see it in my kids. I have two kids who were born in the years after, uh, you, you know, you did, we did Twilight uh, in Los Angeles and they have grown up in a completely different world, you know? It's just so many of the cultural divisions that existed you know, separating white and black people, white and brown people, have just sort of, you know, fallen away during time, you know, in time. 
Um, and so there's a level of comfort, you know, among young people, especially of different races that didn't exist, you know, uh, when I was growing up in Los Angeles. So I think there's a lot of elements that have, you know, that have changed in American society sort of caused this awakening where, you know, I live in, a, in an upper middle class section of Los Angeles, where half of my white neighbors put up signs saying Black Lives Matter. They, they graffitied their own driveways. <laughs> you know, I, I, I never would have imagined seeing that. Never has that happened before. Um, so, so there's been, I think what George Floyd taught us is how much the country had already changed without us being aware of it. You know. Well, how deep do you think that is, the writing on the wall of uh, Black Lives Matter? Because, for example, even as I think about a street like Abbott Kinney in Venice, mm -hmm. uh, where coffee costs $10 a cup and, it, you know, uh, it, all these vegan kids. I, I don't see many kids of color on that street. Right. Asians, uh, you know, from Asia, sometimes I think look like tourists. But so, you know, we still are in this reality of right. the, this tiny group of people who are very, very rich. And then people who aren't. And, you know, in the theater, for example, there's a lot of activism just about opportunity, you know, in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that's working in newspapers in terms of who the editors are and who the publishers are. You know, Times, of course, has right. a, you know, go ahead. No, I, I think that it, you're right. It's, it's, very, it's a very shallow thing at the moment. You know, I think it's very... I think that there isn't, it's a long way from writing Black Lives Matter on your driveway to backing a movement for real structural change, right? Right. Uh, in a country. And no, I don't think we're, we're, you, you, we're, that, we're there yet. You know, I don't think that that's, I think that's still a long way off. Yeah. But these cultural shifts matter. You know, it's like before we had uh, those, you know, the, the last few years of these changes, uh, you know, in LGBTQ rights, right, gay marriage, et cetera, et cetera, we had this whole cultural shift that predated it, right? And um, yeah, people had to fight, keep fighting. It wasn't just enough that Ellen was on television, right, or that we had, uh, you know, uh, all these great movies, uh, you know, about, uh, about same-sex love and all this great cultural work, right? Or even that people were open-minded and everything. It just, you know, it, it takes time. But to me, it's, um, it's, that part of it's optimistic. It's, you know, just to see a reality shift so quickly. You know, I watched the NBA finals. They had Black Lives Matter on the, uh, on the court. And right. let's remember two years ago, uh, you know, just the fact that Colin Kaepernick kneels in the national anthem was, you know, it, it, it caused this incredible backlash. And now that became normal. And now that kind of protest became normalized. You know, and that's important and significant because it gives these activists, it gives them a little bit of wind at their backs. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think about I, my kids, right. you know, I'm it gives them a little bit of wind in there, puts a little bit of wind in their sails. Yes. And exactly. to do the, the necessary work. Absolutely. You know, um, you, you have you, you, you have an opportunity to, you know, work with words in different ways. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, going back to that room, we where all the dramaturgs were, but it was a lot of people uh, just to say to the audience that the way I write plays, everybody always wants to know, well, you have so many interviews. And in the case of, of uh, writing Twilight, I had three, I interviewed 350 people. Uh, <laughs> and so that's a lot of material to get down to, uh, you know, the size that can go on a stage. And I think the first preview was four hours long, if I recall, it was very it was, long. It, I was actually it, out it, on stage for that long. And then every night, we would go in this, it was a dressing room right. with Emily and Oscar and you, and even, even the, some of the designers would be back there. Right. And people would argue. I remember my assistant, Cecilia, walking me back, she always wore spike heels, walking me back to my dressing room saying one time, it's your play, Anna, it's your play. Because there would be this fiery <laughs> arguing about what should be in the play and what shouldn't be in the play. What was different about that process for you? And <laughs> Safe it was it was glorious. <laughs> it was incredibly stressful to me because I worried for you. I mean, how was this woman going to put this play on? You know, I worried for you, but it was glorious to be in a space where people cared about art so much, you know, and that to me, you know, being in a newsroom, right, where we supposedly deal with objective facts, you know, I mean, that process taught me how to be an artist and how to be an artist who cares. And so to see that um, was just absolute. I, I worried, I worried for you. I, I, I stressed out because I felt, you know, I'm the Latino dramaturg. So that means I should be representing my people, you know? And I didn't really want to be in that position. 
Um, but I felt a little bit of, of that of that tension. You well, know? I recall, and I'll be talking to Doreen next week. Both of you came down real hard on me at one point. I ca I can't remember why, but it was like we represent our communities. Right. And you didn't right. go so far as to say I'm taking my name off of it if, but it was definitely right. There was this tense moment where you each were very concerned about. Yes. being perceived as a representative of your right community. right exactly and and you know and this is going to have a little bit of my you know uh okay on it and and am i okay with it but to me now looking at it now that i've written you know five books on my own and been an artist responsible for my own you know um creations how incredibly brave of you to do that you know i mean how incredibly brave for you in the middle of this process to invite this argument around you and um, I just, you know, I, I thought, uh, I mean, looking back at it, I just thought that was an incredibly brave thing to do. But, you know, you're so strong-willed and you just sort of absorbed it. And of course, you were firing back too, right? <laughs> you were, you oh were yeah, getting, I don't, I don't you know? have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was wonderful to see and to see everybody sort of terrified, uh, you know, uh, as, as we got closer, you know, to the opening and, um, you know, and you pulled it off. It was it was amazing to see, but the most, to me, the most important thing was just the very heart of your process, which was about listening to people, you know, and you listened to people and you found poetry in so-called ordinary people's voices. And to me, that was so instructive and it really inspired me and it taught me, you know, it taught me how to think about uh, storytelling and art in a completely different way. So I just wanted to say, if I said anything during this time, just say thank you for inviting me into that process. Oh no, thank you, yeah. because the fact is that my, uh, you know, everything was strange to me. Los Angeles is very different race uh, makeup than uh, uh, Baltimore, where I grew up, or other places I've lived, and I just don't think that the race story. Sometimes people think it is that the race story is black and white, and I couldn't right. possibly come to Los Angeles where there was I'd never seen diversity like that. I couldn't possibly come to Los Angeles and write only from the point of view of black versus white. That yeah. wasn't gonna happen. Speaking of which, you know, we say all the time, black and brown, black and brown, black and brown. To what right. extent is there a community? To what extent do we share um, anxieties and triumphs? And to what extent is that like ambitious or even false? You mean the whole idea of this black and brown sort of alliance? The black and brown or, community, blacks, brown. No, I think, and, you know. it's, I, think, I think it's extremely real. I, 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 you know, remember during the most, re during the George Floyd protests, getting stuck, you know, at an intersection in West LA and just seeing a bunch of teenagers and people in their twenties. And they were like African-American kids and Mexican-American kids and Latino kids, you know, spontaneously marching down the street together, you know? Um, so there's that. And I, there are now, you know, literary magazines. There are, there's, you know, there's a whole sort of identity of Blacksican that's really sort of taking hold in South Los Angeles because it turns out as you, you know, as we know, you know, this is very so common in history. When you put two groups of people together Guess who seem to be very different and you have them living next to each other, you know, next thing you know, there's babies being born and people falling in love and writing poetry to, to each other, right? And so, so there's all these black and, you know, there's all these blacksican kids now. Some of them are my students at UC Irvine where I teach. And that's a very real thing. And, you know, I sort of feel like, they're there, but they're so young that 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 community is still so young that that community is going to shift American literature, American arts in so many dramatic ways, you know, that we can't even see yet. I mean, there's an Arthur Miller, you know, there is a, there's there, there's a James Joyce, you know, in, in those uh, waiting to sort of, you know, to start creating their, their it, works it, of genius. Are you seeing at Irvine of new forms or how's the content different than when you were, when you, you alluded to Baldwin well, earlier, he's still yes. be one of your North stars, but. Yes. Well, you know, there's a complexity to the storytelling, uh, to the emotional landscape that is not present right now in American fiction, especially American fiction about Latino people. I mean, yes, we have, you know, some great storytellers, but there's sort of a level of complexity and a kind of dealing with dysfunction because it turns out that, you know, one of the things that really powers immigration is not just immigrant ambition, but it's also the dysfunction, right? That in poor families, you know, story, time eternal. And so to, uh, there's, uh, you know, so much more honesty in their work about that um, than I see that's, a, that's even allowed, you know, because of course we know, especially in television and film, right? How much is mediated, right? Between the, the storyteller and the final product, right? 
Um, and so when you get to see sort of this young, raw storyteller, you just see so much more emotional complexity. And that to me is, 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 um, is something that's really gonna rock people's world when it starts to reach uh, you know, their bookstores and libraries. What are you working on now as a resident uh, at, at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard? Well, I am writing a, a nonfiction book, an essay, an extended essay, which I described earlier to you as a, an essay inspired by uh, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. Um, an essay about what it's like to be a brown person, a person of Latin American descent in this age of intolerance. You know, well, Baldwin is writing in the 1960s. Uh, he's right, you know, the, the civil rights movement's going down and there's all this hatred on the streets. The Klan is sort of making its last stand right across the South. And he, and he write, and you know, of course this horrible segregation exists in, in Northern cities, you know, New York, et cetera. And he writes this sort of tone poem, this prose poem uh, of, uh, uh, you know, of just writing to his, to his, to the younger generation saying, look, this is where we stand as a people. And so I'm trying to write an, a, a sort of essay about, um, you know, what it's like to live through this moment when there's so much intolerance and hatred directed uh, towards Latino immigrants, especially, you know, and how we react to that and how people have created their own sort of sense of self um, despite this, you know, uh, hatred directed towards them. So that's my next book. I'm calling it right now, The Migrant's Light. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's my next project. That's very, very interesting. You know, the difference, uh, the big difference now with Twilight Los Angeles is it's being performed by five actors. Uh, my play Fires in the Mirror was performed by another actor at, at Signature Theater where I'm currently one of the resident playwrights. Uh, a man played the, the part uh, instead of me, of the one person in Fires in the Mirror. And we have five actors and I really wanted them to have a chance to talk to you because, you know, look, they weren't, I don't even know if they were born during um, <laughs> the uprising. What did you call it, by the way? Did you call it Revolution Uprising, Riot? Uh, you know, I think it was all, it was, I call it all those things because it was all those things. It was an uprising at first and then it became a riot and then it became, you know, a poverty riot and then it became something in Spanish, Los Quemazones. Does that <laughs> so mean? I call it uh, the great burning, the burning, I the, love the great fires. That's yes, bad. the fires, yes. That's so it was all those things and it was whatever it's called in Korean. You know, I think it was all those different events. Well, part of, of, of what they uh, will be doing is learning about the reality. And so I wanted them to be a part of this. And um, uh, I, well, can we get the actors? I don't know how to do any of the technology. They're supposed I to promise. appear magically. Here they come. Okay, great. So with us, we have uh, Tiffany Rochelle Stewart and Wesley T. Jones. Um, they're each playing lots of roles, uh, some in their own gender and uh, their own uh, race and some not. And um, so here we go. Let's, uh, you guys just take it away. Um, I can moderate it, but I, I know that if we were in a, a live room, your hands would be waving and stuff. So <laughs> take it away. Whoever wants to ask uh, Hector Tobar a question. I have a bazillion questions, Hector, but um, I'm gonna just jump in with one. Um, and I was born when Twilight Los <laughs> Angeles came out. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> I actually was um, t maybe 19 when Twilight LA came to my BFA program oh, at wow. Florida State University. They did not know how to cast actresses of color. So I never got cast. And when this showed up, I was like, oh, 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 oh I'm about to get cast for this. <laughs> and then I didn't get cast in that either. Oh so my now, God. Everything. Well, it, it was, it had, there was a lot of weird racial stuff there in Florida. Um, so it did everything um, right. to be cast by Anna and Taby. Um, mm. Yeah. So my question, Hector, is, you know, riot. Anna was just like drilling down on the verbiage uprising. What did you see mm -hmm. in 1992? that, you know, you talked about right now, we mm -hmm. all watched what happened to George Floyd while we, George Floyd, while we were sitting at home, stuck in our houses, right. leaned in to what happened to him. But we all felt disparity before that happened. Right, right. We all knew that black people were being murdered in the streets before that happened. So in 1992, I'm just wondering what, what, cause you know, I'm just so curious 
about what causes a pot to boil over, oh, what absolutely. causes the cup to spill the moment it spills. So what did you see? What did you feel in 1992? That well, you know, yeah, one thing I'll, uh, I'll say is that we did not have a Black Lives Matter movement as a national movement that, had, you know, uh, it, today, right, before George Floyd happened, almost everybody knew of the existence of Black Lives Matter. If you grew up in a little town in Idaho, you know, because you have the internet, you watch television, you knew there was a thing called Black Lives Matter. You, you know, you might have gotten a version of it that was demonized, right, by the right wing media, but you knew they existed, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in 1991, 1992, when these events uh, went down, um, there wasn't that kind of awareness, you know, there hadn't been that kind of laying of that groundwork, right? Uh, you know, so, so there was just a lot of, for me, a lot of really unfocused rage. Mm -hmm. So when I think of what happened in 1992, um, I just think of this really a, a moment of really focused rage in, in a, that began with a few sparks in a few corners of Los Angeles, right? And actually corners of Los Angeles where there was slightly more affluent um, people, African-American people than there were in other parts, right? It didn't begin in the projects. Right. It began at Florence and Normandy, where people own properties, or it began over, you know, actually some of the first rocks were thrown in Lamert Park, right, a more affluent part of, uh, of Los Angeles, and so um, uh, of South Los Angeles, and so you know, I just think of this, un this, you know, there's that rage, right, which I think we've all felt, but also a sense of disenfranchisement, right, and voicelessness. So today, anybody can get on Twitter. Anybody can get on, you know, Facebook. Well, maybe not Facebook or you know, Instagram, and say, you know, the world sucks. This is incredibly racist, right? So imagine you didn't have access to that. Imagine living in a world where, you know, your shouts are heard. You know, maybe there'll be ten minutes on the news at the evening news, right? Even cable news isn't all that, you know, common. And that's it. You just you you feel like people aren't listening to you, and I think that is. That is the, um, that's, that's the spark, right? Now, the other thing in Los Angeles is, you know, what, what causes this to become a citywide conflagration and not just a few people throwing rocks in a street corner is just the already, you know, the, the slow unwinding of Los Angeles as this American dream, right? Mm -hmm. The, the deindustrialization of, of Los Angeles, right? South Los Angeles used to be circled by auto factories, by tire factories. Those factories have closed. 1992, they've been closed for like a decade, decade or two, right? Then you've got this mass of Latino immigration. You know, many, many people just arrived. Um, people who are beginning to see that they're just an exploitable workforce. And then you also have a whole series of incidents that have taken place very, very close to, you know, uh, in South Los Angeles, you know, the shooting of, um, uh, you know, of, by a Korean merchant in a liquor store, very, very publicized shooting. So all those things together, you know, it's like a, almost like a perfect storm, right? That caused this general malaise, this sort of sense. We have a general malaise, a sense of injustice, but for it to become an event that destroys, you know, um, you know thousands of buildings, mm -hmm. it takes a certain kind of equation for that to sort of all come together, you know? Mm -hmm. And that to me is what happened in Los Angeles, you know? But more than anything, just the frustration, you know, it, it's, it, it was a line, at least in some of the drafts that I remember seeing in, in the play and, uh, you know, Maxine Waters saying, uh, you know, riot is the Tiffany voice of the unheard. It Tiffany still is in the play. play Maxine. Actually, Tiffany will be yeah. playing. Yeah, and so Maxine says this, riot is the voice of the unheard. And I think people felt more unheard in 1992 than they did in 2020. Right. Wesley, what about you? Yeah, I, on the contrary, I wasn't born um, <laughs> yet. This, this was two years prior to my arrival. Um, and I guess, you know, I'm very aware I th think that's the kind of the difference between someone who's here then and someone who was born afterwards is that like now my generation is a lot more aware and a lot more forced to see um, mm -hmm. a lot of the injustices uh, versus that time where, I mean, you knew it was happening, but it wasn't sort of in your face unless you experienced it. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not one with many questions. I'm kind of just like wrapping my head around stepping into the sh shoes of the lot, like particularly mm -hmm. um, the the attorney. Uh, his last name is Floyd. 
so forget his first Lloyd, name. Charles, um, Charles Lloyd. He was yeah, the attorney I, uh, for Sunjai Du, Hector. Right, oh, right, so, right. And I, I don't know if it's changed, but in our first read through, I was reading for him. And, you know, I think it's a very interesting um, role to play from my perspective personally, because he was on the opposing side to me in my eyes. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's just being younger and not having been here during this time, but also being so aware and immune and sometimes numb to the fact. Uh, I just, I wonder what insight you all may have to someone like me. Well, I think that's something that is your, it works to your advantage as an artist trying to enter this experience. Because there is that, that's exactly how we all felt. That's exactly how we all felt. We all felt like innocence. You know, we all felt like, uh, we all felt the sense of confusion, right? To, you know, that, that sense when you read this speech by, you know, uh, you know by, by someone who's in a position you never sort of would have imagined. And just sort of that dissonance between what you, the way you understand the world and the way they do, that's perfect, you know? I mean, to me, that's, you know, that's something that, um, that, that we all felt in Los Angeles then. Uh, you know, I, if I had never interviewed a Korean merchant before the 92 riot, I mean, riots. And then I got sent out to go interview, <laughs> go do some interviews after the riots took place. And I interviewed my first, uh, you know, my first uh, Korean donut lady, this lady who operated a donut shop. And it was like, oh my God, she's like my father, you know, <laughs> she, she's like working like crazy. She's working two jobs. And so, you know, uh, but that sort of sense of shock, too, is part of the truth of it, you know? That shock that I felt meeting this Korean woman, uh, or even watching Anna rehearse this play and seeing her do that incredible talent agent. It's like, oh, my God, you know, like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? And he, he, you know, he would later, when the play came out, he would rock. The audience just roared with laughter. And we all roared with laughter in the rehearsals when Anna brought this to us, you know? the anonymous uh, talent agent, uh, the anonymous Hollywood, you know, um, bigwig who, who speaks, right? They're burning the Beverly Center. And so to me, that's shocking. You know, there's no way I could wrap my, I, I, there's, to me, it's like this reminder of like, wow, I, I did not know people like that existed, you know? Especially well, not to speak, I mean, you know, our, the, also the, uh, the real estate agent. Um, the real estate Leslie, agent. you play the real estate agent. Don't you play, yeah. Elaine? At yes. some point. Yeah, I well, mean, yeah. playing the real estate agent. And I think, I think LA real estate agents, and she's like, right. you know, at lunch every day at the Beverly Hills Hotel. You know, I think of these kind of Beverly Hills women who are real estate, I think that's a special breed. I don't know anybody like that in New York. Have you come across anybody like that after? <laughs> No, no, they're a special breed. And, you know, it's bad enough in, uh, you know, in a, in a so, so rich area, like where I have to go sometimes, La Canada, Flint Ridge or Pastina, but Beverly Hills, oh my God, that's like, that's like, I feel like I'd have to go, you know, be teleported there somehow. <laughs> I, I never go there. I never go there. It's just so shocking. And that's really the wonderful thing about the play is that you have all these people who are in their own little worlds who have been forced to deal with each other because of this event, right? And to me, um, you know, just to see these personalities dealing with each other, um, you know, through your creation is, is just really wonderful. So I think a little, a little confusion is definitely appropriate. Wesley, aren't you also playing Shelby Coffee at some point, the editor of the- Oh my God. <laughs> do you, re do you, are, do you get to do recall. that? Huh? I don't, recall. I don't recall if that was me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you do get to say some of his words, but that was one right. of my- characters to play and I actually became friendly with him uh <laughs> yeah um just for those of you who don't know you know uh, old school editor white hair big you know big big mop of white hair um very very rich from a wealthy family I think he's from southern. Tennessee originally southern, southern. yeah yes he's from Tennessee uh and also kind of just a bit of a character in the newsroom uh yeah but a great editor and um yeah and the editor of the paper and yeah that was that was wonderful well, you know, Hector, we, we're going to be closing down in a minute, and this is just, we, you and I have to get in touch again, because it's always so wonderful to talk to you. You know, when you were talking about Los Angeles then, one of the things that occurred to me, too, because I, I taught at USC for uh, five years, from 85 till 90, pretty much. Oh, I wow. felt it, it like doing time. 
uh, because <laughs> it was so, there's something really, uh, it felt like a police state everywhere. Yeah, USC is uh, like that. First of all, USC is the only college, and I've taught at NYU, I've, ta I've taught um, at so many colleges, <laughs> I've visited so many colleges, you know, at Harvard, there are no guards as you, are there any guards at the entryways to Harvard? No, there are certainly none at NYU. There weren't any at Stanford when I taught there. USC in the hood, had guards at every gate. What kind of a message is that to the community? And I saw them chase black kids off of the campus on their bikes. But also living in West Hollywood, don't you remember that time oh. your helicopters every single night? Oh yeah. What is the sense in Los Angeles of living in a police state? Right. There was, especially in the 1990s, especially in the 1990s, you know, things have mellowed in the last uh, 10, 15 years or so because crime is down so much. Um, but yes, you know, that and, and USC is an incredible contradiction because here is this incredibly wealthy institution with a huge endowment uh, surrounded by still by some of the poorest neighborhoods in Los Angeles and places that burned in 92. That That in itself would be a an interesting sort of play, uh, you know, in itself, just to, to do a play about USC during the riots, you know, how that must, did, what that must have I been. Talked, like. I talked to some get some USC right. horrors about it. Right, right. That must have been, that must have been pretty incredible. Um, but no, you know, and so, you know, in Los Angeles right now, it's like, I think they've gotten better at managing the contradictions, but the contradictions are actually worse, right? And so the police are, the you know, they're are worse now. The contradictions are worse. Wow. The contradictions say, say of wealth and poverty. That. What's say that? A little bit more about the contradictions well, are worse now. I mean, well, for starters, let's, you know, just go with the simple fact that we have uh, a huge population in California and especially of Los Angeles of undocumented people, people who are de facto Americans born, you know, not born, but raised in the United States, fluent English speakers who have no rights, right? And so who have to sort of sneak around or some of them have DACA, which is this temporary status, but they're still undocumented immigrants, a status that can be taken away from them at any moment. It's essentially a new version of Jim Crow, right? You've created a substandard, sub-citizen class of people who labor among us, right? So that has spread, you know, throughout the city, throughout Cal that didn't exist in 1992, right? You had lots of undocumented immigrants, but we had just had an amnesty, right? We had just had an amnesty in 86, where many, many you know, Latino people became uh, legal residents, they were becoming citizens. And so that to me is, is outrageous. You know, we all have to go back to reading W.B. Du Bois to understand what that's like, right? Because W.B. You know, du Bois writes in the height of, of Jim Crow, of segregation, late 19th century, writing about a people who are subjected to humiliations, right? That is what's going on with Los Angeles is that we have this huge population of undocumented immigrants. Right. And the wealth and poverty, you know, the shrinking middle class, you know, it's just it's it's just th that's what I mean when I say the contradictions are even worse now than they were then. But the police, you know, the police have had now 25 years, 30 years of sensitivity training. <laughs> Some of it has actually helped uh, a little bit, you know. Well, Hector, thank you so much. You're so rich. You've left us with so many things to think about. And um I'll ask the director uh, if we ever, you know, we were supposed to be on stage, not me, these wonderful actors supposed to be on stage last spring. We still don't know when the play will get uh, to be on stage. Uh, but if you're in New York, I hope you'll come by and, and spread your wisdom to all of us. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm crazy about you and, and what you do. So thank you so much for, for being with us today. No, thank you so much for having me, Anna. It was um, wonderful, uh, you know, to talk with you again, and it was incredibly. It was one of the. It was a transformative experiences uh, to be with you on that, you know, in those rehearsals, and to be your dramaturg, one of your dramaturgs, and to Tiffany and and, and Wesley break a leg, you know, uh, you know, and enjoy enjoy losing yourself in this text, right, and um and, and bringing it to life in your own way and and finding your ways into it because. Uh, it's a really wonderful work of art, uh, and it's an even more wonderful work of art when you bring it to the stage and bring it to life. So thank you. Thank you, Hector. Wonderful to meet you. Wonderful to meet you, too. Thanks.